the head of my uh, the heading rather of my talk today is only love so you know I had trouble coming up with a heading and of course I don't mean by this that there's there's nothing else in the world um, but love is important and when we look through the pages of the Bible we find that God puts himself forward as not only the God of love but John says God is love and so well, there's some interesting things here and I, look I don't think it's all about answers today but I'm certainly going to raise a few questions and a few things to think about um, and uh, uh, hopefully as we go through these things we will, we will just start to ponder the great love that we have been called to the great love that we are to uh, exhibit and what the future may hold and and, and what will it, what's it all for what's it all for so um, in the, on the September the 11th 2001 the World Trade Center was hit by two airplanes that brought it down it didn't happen immediately I guess you all remember it it's, it's quite uh, certainly etched in my mind I I was in Coffs Harbour at the time, I arrived at work not having heard anything that had happened. I'd gone to sleep before it had happened and the radio sounded weird and um, uh, part of my thinking of course was, is something, has something happened? Maybe the Lord's going to return, you know, like it just was just so weird. And I got into work and the guy said, um, I said to, to one of the guys at work, what's happened? Everything, everyone sounds weird on the radio. And he pulled me over to a computer and showed me and it was very, very um, dramatic and very shocking. And um, during that day, you know, uh, hundreds of, uh, and thousands uh, of people died, but hundreds of people got out and they walked down, you know, flights and flights of stairs down the fire escapes and they escaped and they were panicked and they were, you know, it was shocking. And um, on the 68th floor, a fellow called Michael Benfantis came across a disabled stranger in a wheelchair in the fire escape and uh, people are panicking and streaming past him and this guy couldn't let this woman go and so he co-opted another panicked guy no doubt and they carried this woman down 68 floors um, got out of the world trade center minutes before it fell to the ground why why did he do that uh, why did he take the risk and it turned out it was a very real risk that he took what do you think what made him do it was it some kind of i don't know altruism of some kind his story is pretty interesting because he became depressed after that and he actually became an alcoholic he was he was very depressed even though he'd done this wonderful thing and eventually he got over that depression and, and um, uh, got over his alcoholism and the reason was he decided that it was not right that firemen had run into the world trade center and tried to save other people like he had managed to do and it wasn't right for him to live his life in a way that was disrespectful of them so it's sort of interesting and you, and you do ask yourself the question why why did he do it was it just I don't know you know you, you, you just you don't know what else to do you just do it well everyone else sort of knew what to do you had to get down the stairs and get out but he didn't so ten days ago a fellow called Abdul Aziz who was in the New Zealand mosque and um, y you know the story, I'm not going to go through it all. But he ran towards the attacker and he, uh, he fended him off with a credit card machine. I don't know if you've read the story or heard the story. Um, he basically threw a credit card machine, which doesn't sound very big to me, um, at the attacker. And, and, and basically, actually this is in one of the mosques, and sort of chased him back into his car and probably saved a whole lot of lives. Why did he do it? Was he crazy brave? you know people do things about uh, he probably didn't think much probably like Michael uh, Benfantis he probably didn't think much he just felt no this, th no this is what I'm gonna do why do we love people why do, why do we have some kind of connection with other people that makes us put our lives in danger and of course I could have told a thousand other stories I could have gone back to world wars and, and uh, uh, put people putting their lives on the line for their mates and in the trenches and all that kind of stuff. Why do we do that? Let's go to the Bible. We'll turn to 1 John chapter 4. Just from verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him, we love God, because he first loved us. 
If any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God loves his brother also. So who is our brother? Well, here in John, and you can sort of read the context and you know, look at all the words and so on, and he's actually talking about people in the church. That, that's who John's talking about. And he's t- when he talks about his brother, he's talking about you know, your brother in the Lord. And I guess that's pretty easy for us to sort of go with, you know, like that, that makes sense. Um, that means, you know, our brothers and sisters here in the Lord and we can look around and uh, we can think, yep, yep, we, we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it's certainly at least that. Um, he was talking about, you know, again, if you look into the words, he's talking about those that believe. And so, you know, in, in our world, and we understand this, there are many other people who, um, who think they know God um, and have some kind of belief. Are, are they included? I, I don't know. Like I said, it's not all answers. Uh, there are certainly lots of other people filled with the Holy Spirit. Are they, are they our brothers and sisters whom we should love? Well, yes, that seems much more obvious. So we should do that. We should love other believers. Um, the Bible tells us that love rejoices in the truth, and you can read that in 1 Corinthians 13. And so that doesn't mean we accept anything. You don't just accept everything because your idea of love is nothing matters. If your idea of love is that you care about people, there's things you won't accept on their behalf that they may see better and come to a better relationship uh, with God. And so, you know, this isn't sort of anything goes kind of love. Love rejoices in the truth. But right here, close in our fellowship here, we care about each other, right? Right? Well, isn't it hard in a family? Of course we care about each other. And, and look, it's a good start. Um, sometimes we know each other too well. Sometimes we've known each other a long time. Um, we, like, uh, like a husband and wife can do, you know the buttons to press with some people. You still love them. But you know the buttons to press to, to annoy them. Why would you do that? I, I don't think it's a case of not loving them, but it's a case of maybe we're just difficult people. I, I, I don't know. Um, God saw something in us. Well, scratch that. He said we were hopeless. The, the only thing he saw in us was a desire to be different to how we were. And God said, I'll work with that. And we heard a couple of testimonies today, and we, talked about, we heard that people are receiving the Holy Spirit. And the thought there is they received the Holy Spirit was, was all around the fact that they wanted to know God. They wanted to know if this was real and if it was true. And, um, and they were willing to find out. And that seems to be enough for God to work with because in both those cases we heard about they were filled, the, the two gentlemen, as it turned out, were filled with the Holy Spirit and came into their own personal relationship with God. And so they came at that moment to be brother, brothers, in the case of those two gentlemen, but all of us, brothers and sisters, with each other uh, in, the, in the household of God with a common faith and a common uh, union and a common fellowship and all those kinds of things. And we're told, and, and like it, it's, it's not like we should have to be told, love each other. It's sort of easy. God loved us first. Let's go back a couple of, let's go back one chapter for 1 John chapter 3. And we read um, verse, verse 1 Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What manner of love? Down in verse 10 In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, and neither uh, he that loves not his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. So again, he's just reminding each other. So, you know, in terms of our fellowship and the people that we are here, you know, together in the Lord, um, where's your heart on that? And uh, look, you probably don't stop and think about it because it's obvious to you, and that's great. Um, But if you, you know... Look, I know, I know that we can annoy each other. I know that I can be annoying. I I heard it once. I I think it was back in 1987. I think I might have been annoying for five minutes, but I got over it. No, of course we can. And we think differently about a whole lot of things. And um, I think there is a family sort of angle there that you're more annoyed by people in your own family than you often are by other people. And the reason is, it's a good reason, because you care 
you actually care about each other and um, you know somewhere deep down we love each other we must love each other or we just read it's not of God so back to 1 John chapter 4 just over the page again we go from verse 7 beloved let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God he that loves not knows not God for God is love in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the, the, the answer, the, 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 the payment uh, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It's sort of obvious. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. And so gone, uh, John, you know, who, who's, who's now an old man, like the, this was written somewhere around 100 AD, and, um, you, you know, John was an apostle in 30 AD, and I don't know how old he was, so he must have been heading towards 100, like he's an old man, and he's seen a lot of stuff. I, what would he have seen go down in the church? He, he, he might have been there, I should have looked it up, at the Council of Jerusalem where Paul the Apostle had to go and talk about the Gentiles. He might have seen all that kind of stuff. He might have seen the arguments. He might have seen Paul and Peter arguing with each other. I understand Pastor Simon spoke about Paul last week. Uh, all of these things, you know, he, he would have seen perhaps all of that. He would have seen, unfortunately, people come and people go. He would have seen people that he loved, that he would have been disappointed with uh, in, uh, that they let things go and uh, let their salvation uh, wither away or become a shipwreck. He's seen it all. But this is his great insight. We love each other. And the love of God is perfected in us when we operate and think that way. Um, there is no other way. Uh, God demonstrated his love to us through the death of Jesus Christ and sending him. So how can we hold back from our own brothers and sisters for whom he also died? So that's sort of the easy part. What about other people? Um, what about our neighbours? Let's go to Romans, Romans 13. Just from verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness, uh, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, in other words, here's a summary, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Um, love works no will to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So there's the whole Old Testament, you know, done, done and dusted. And that knowing the time that now is, it is high time to wake out of sleep. And for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So just back there in verse sort of 8, and uh, in fact I'm going to go back to verse 7 now. Render therefore to all their dues, a tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. So he's talking about everybody. He's talking about their place in society. And when he's talking about tribute to whom tribute is due, uh, that's, that's paying taxes. That's what he's talking about there. And then he says in verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. So the only debt, he, he said, the only debt that we should hold in society... Uh, not to say you can't get a mortgage or anything like that. I, I'm talking like at something that you owe to somebody that you're not fulfilling. Uh, the only debt, you the way you should think about that is, am I loving them enough? That's what he said there. Um, Render everyone to their dues, sure. Don't owe any man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. So that's some um, society. Um, your debt of love to people. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. We may have heard this before. Who is my neighbour? Let's go to Luke chapter 10. You know all this. This is all sort of simple stuff in one sense, but, you know, it bears thinking about. Luke 10, and this is a very well-known story. Let's read it. Verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? 
He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Look, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. And he said unto him, You've answered well, you've answered right. Do this and you shall live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbour? So, so here's the classic question. And I started off talking about our close relationship as a fellowship and, and, and others that are spirit-filled and so on. And uh, then I talk about others maybe that believe and, you know, I, I don't know, but maybe we should love them all. And uh, here, was, here we're reading about um, a neighbour. And the guy's answered the question. He's got the right answer. But, but he, he said, but, but really, yeah, it's a classic lawyer question. I'm sorry to lawyers, but it's, it's a classic kind of... It's a, you know why lawyers ask this kind of question? Because they're after the truth of it. It says here he was seeking to justify himself. He must have been a bad lawyer. But for the rest of them, they just want to know. And um, Jesus' answer is this. The question is, who is my answer? Jesus answering said, A certain man, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, his clothes, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. Uh, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and took him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And he said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these three, asked Jesus, thinkest thou was neighbour unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. This is, this, this is a well-known story. And... Um, you know, Jesus tells these kind of stories and, and he makes us think. Jesus was good at that. He made people think. And half the time they really didn't like it when he did that. Probably more than half the time. And, uh, and he does it for us. You know, we, we, as we read through the scriptures, it's not all confirmation of I'm a great guy. Sometimes it's to make us think. And um, so he did that. And of course, Jesus picked a Samaritan. Why did he pick a Samaritan? Because they were despised. You sort of read the history around them. They were not like us. They were different. They had different customs and cultures. Uh, they are probably the subject of fake news. Uh, maybe they are called illegal. I don't know. Every time I read this parable, and I've read it a few times, the last time was five years ago, because I, you know, I keep track of my talks. I often have people lining up to give me alternate meanings, you know, what the parable's about. But I'm going to ask you to take a step back. The question was, who is my neighbour? And Jesus told this story in answer to that question. And of course the answer is, the one who needed help. And so um, that's interesting. And of course the other part that he was answering and agreeing with the lawyer was, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thy soul, strength, heart and mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And that was the question, who is my neighbour? And that was the answer. So the answer's got nothing to do with uh, the lineage of people, which was important in those days, uh, maybe for some it still is, nothing to do with race or religion or politics or culture or colour of skin or age or sex. The things that divide us and that people make money out of uh, make money out of society in generally and, c and creating division about, um, none of that is encompassed in what Jesus said in this simple story of a man who was in need. And it wasn't just that we should be helpful. Jesus was really explaining what love meant uh, in the concept, uh, in the context rather, of the second great commandment. And so it wasn't, you know, there's various things the man could have done, I suppose, but he, he, he actually went out of his way. He made, you know, it was difficult for him, the Samaritan. Uh, he took him to an inn. He gave the innkeeper money. He said, when I come back tomorrow, if you, you, know, if you need more money, I'll give you more money. Like, he, he really went all the way. And Jesus said, this is an example of love. So it makes us think. Um, makes me think. And, um, you know, of all the things that we can be helpful or not helpful in our relationships in, in society and the way that we're seen, because we are the demonstrators of God's love. That, that, that's what we're called to do. We're ca uh, called to let people see in us what God has done and tell them about it. That's our calling. And um, 
every now and then someone will pass on the hateful rumour or, or that, that meme you shared on the, on the internet or something like that and you think, oh, is it really who we are? Let's go to Matthew 22 because, uh, you know, so far we've only really had the lawyer's interpretation and Jesus agreeing with him on what the great commandments were. So let's have a look at this, Matthew 22 and bear the, bear the repetition because it bears repeating. Matthew 22, verse 36. S now, this, someone's asking him this question, whether it's the same lawyer, and I, I, I don't know. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Verse 37, Jesus said uh, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law, and the prophets. So, people think that love's naive. People think, look, you can't actually run a society that way. And we all often, oh, maybe it's just me, it's probably just me, we put ourselves in the shoes of people who are running countries and decide that we will help them make the decisions on how things should be. And what happens is you end up not being a demonstrator of the kingdom to come, but a kind of um, cheer her on of the difficulties in the kingdom of right now um, you can't well maybe you can't run, run a society on love I don't know, so be it we are the vanguard of the kingdom to come, we are the ones who are to demonstrate the world to come and Jesus said on these two things, love, your, love God and love your neighbour hang all the law and the prophets so I decided to do a little bit of research because I thought Okay, so there's the first two commandments, love God and love your neighbour. You know, what are the other eight? This is how my mind went, and, and you're all smarter than me, you've already worked out the problem I ran into. You look up the Ten Commandments, and, the, and, and love God and love your neighbour isn't there. A am I the only one who, who has noticed this? They're actually not there. There's things that you could extrapolate from it, and both the phrase, love God, with all your heart and soul, and love your neighbour, uh, do appear in the Old Testament, they appear sort of in round Leviticus and Deuteronomy, sort of in the regulations. Jesus, of course, picked those out and said, this is what it really means. But it's sort of interesting, what is there? So, um, the commandment that you might think, if you're going to look for it, as I did this morning, would be, love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, strength and mind. When you go to the Ten Commandments, it's written like this, don't have any graven images, don't use my name in vain, keep the Sabbath. So, they're all... They're all a bit mechanical and of course God's not saying to people you must love me he's saying I don't think you've got it in you to love me so the best you can do is not to disrespect me don't use my name in vain don't make any graven images and say that that's God uh, uh, and I've told you about the Sabbath keep that a day when you think about me and that it's a kind of please don't disrespect me kind of love there's no commandment in the Ten Commandments to love your neighbour the, in the Ten Commandments, there's, there's commandments like this. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't be a false witness. Don't do the wrong thing in terms of other people. So he's not saying love other people, but at least don't make things worse for other people. Don't be a false witness, don't steal from them, don't commit adultery. Don't th make things worse for other people. And that's sort of as good as it gets in the Old Testament. Apart from, as I said, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, sort of hidden in the regulations. I, I really mean this, like the regulations, like, you know, when you take your neighbour's uh, donkey, uh, make sure that, you, you, you know, if you hurt your neighbour's donkey, give him, give him 30 shekels. I, I can't remember it all, but all that kind of stuff. And then hidden in there, you'll find, um, you know, that you should love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus looked at these things and he really um, parsed, that's a computing term, he, he, he uh, um, uh, analysed the... Uh, Ten Commandments, and he said all these things that are talking about that, what they're really saying is, because he could say it now because he was looking forward to the kingdom to come and the people who had God's love within them, he's saying this is what's really happening, it's about love God and it's about love your neighbour as yourself. So who are we? We are the ones literally and truly created in his image. When he created man, uh, men and women, you can read that, that all the way back there in Genesis, he created them in his image. Um, and that was perhaps in the way they saw the world and, and, and their understanding that there was an eternity, he hath set eternity in the heart of man and so on. 
But in terms of um, when Jesus came upon the scene, he was looking forward to something quite different that was to be ushered in at his death on the cross where he demonstrated his love to us. And that was that we would come to know him in spirit and in truth and that the Holy Spirit of God would enter into our very beings and change us from within. And so he could say the, tra the, the commandments look like they're all about just don't be horrible to God or don't be horrible to people. But really what God intended from the get-go was love. I want you to understand how to love people and I'm not going to educate you in that, I'm going to just put it in your heart. John said God is love and we are part of God and we are too, we are made in his image. And if not, if, if that's not how we're operating, who are we? You know, is the question we need to uh, ask ourselves and, and look, you, you know, you stand up the front and say provocative things, oh, I'm you should never get the impression that I have this more sorted than you because I don't. We all struggle with these things. We all have, you know, the things and biases that come up within us. But God's saying, well, who are you though? God is love. Um, and if you're having trouble loving some people because we all have our, our issues, at least start with the Ten Commandments way. Don't re disrespect them. Um, don't, uh, I don't mean that in, in, a, in a sort of, you know, what words you use. I'm talking about our attitude towards them. Recognise um, that, that, you know, that we don't have to be uh, difficult. Most of us are good at keeping that don't murder somebody commandment. I, I've, I've kept that one so far. I've, I've come close, but, but no, no, so far, so good. Um, but, you know, there's one in there that says, be careful of false witness. Careful about what we say. You know, sometimes, you know, we say things we shouldn't. Where does this end up? So this is sort of pretty interesting because God set all this up and he set it all up for a reason. There is the world to come. There is the ages of the ages. Where does it all end up? In 1 Corinthians 15, we read, we read that we will be all in all, or rather, God will be all in all and we will be with him. And God is love. And so I, I don't know how it finishes you know, there's a lot of speculation about the mechanics in between, you know, the, the ages of the ages and the, and the rise of Israel and, and, the, and, the, and the coming down of this and the 50,000 years and the eternal, eternal uh, punishment or annihilation of the wicked or, or uh, you know, eternal goodness and God all in all. I don't know. But I know where God's headed. And, you know, it is only love. He's a real spiritual being. I'm not trying to take a concept and say God is that concept. God is a real spiritual being with whom we have had personal interaction and there's nothing like it. Um, but he says of himself that he is love. And um, so I don't know, idle speculation now, but he is God in this self-existent state for eternity before now. Eternity before. And he defined or perhaps he just was love. Isn't that hard to understand? Well, you, you know, I wrote that down and then I wrote hard to understand because I don't know. But here's what I know. We have joined in the greatest love story that the world has ever and will ever know. And we are part of that. And every now and then we see things happen in the world and we see it, you know, just within people and so on. We see little glimmers of what God intends. And so Michael Benfantes, you know, when he stopped on the 68th floor and help that woman down, you know, he probably can't explain to himself, but somewhere within him, he wanted to do good to somebody else. And that's as close as it came. That's like a little glimmer. Uh, Abdul Aziz, when he ran towards the attacker and threw a credit card machine at him and chased him out of one of the mosques, he, he doesn't know why he did it, I would imagine. Uh, but somehow, some little glimmer of something. And God looks upon his creation you know, which he created for a reason and that everything that he put in place, had, an, had a, everything he did was for a purpose. We read that all the way back in, in Genesis. His word never goes out void, but it accomplish, accomplishes that for which it was sent. And God sent all this in, into being. Uh, he created mankind. He created all of us. We're here on the earth. Things are going on all over the place. He's got a plan for us in the near term. 
and he's got a plan for us individually. But where's it all headed? And what does it all mean in the absolute fullness of time? Somewhere down that track, we will have an understanding of what it means to be part of and involved in and an absolute uh, you know, participant in the love of God for his whole creation for all time. And if that's not worth being a part of, I don't know what else is. What's life for? Well, it's to come to know him in spirit and truth. God who is love. And in the end, that's probably all that matters. Only love. Amen.